Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a range rover with three people in it. Yeah. It appears that they're, they're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor over. Hello, Hello. 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 And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. Steele spoke about his friendship with Pat Tate, how the pair had been so close that they'd even taken foreign holidays together on a number of occasions. The jury was shown pictures of the pair laughing and joking together, Steele's partner, Jackie Street, was also firm friends with Sarah Saunders, and the pair would call each other most nights. When I first met Pat, he had a magnetic personality, said Steele. He was lovely to be with. He never changed with me, but over the years he became more and more of a junkie. It was sad to watch what was happening. Towards the end, 70% of me disliked him, but the other 30% of me loved him. When he and Sarah had split up, he was getting out of control. He said a lot of things I'm sure he didn't mean. He told Sarah that we didn't want to see her anymore. He said to her, Mickey and Jackie, they're not your friends, they're my friends, and they're only putting up with you because I want it, because I say so. He started telling her lies, that we were saying stuff about her. He was doing anything to upset her and it worked. He was still giving her money to look after their son, but when things got really bad, he started being cruel about it. Rather than giving her the money once a week, he'd let it go 10 or 15 days. Sometimes she was desperate. I lent her a £100 once just to help her get through. Sarah is very nice. She's a very, very nice person. She took to me. I was like a father figure to her. It's total rubbish about an affair though. Nonsense. She is a woman of 24. I am a man of 55. Still told the jury that a bullying incident in the hospital was one of a number that over time increased attention between Nichols and Tate. The situation broke down completely after Nichols brought over some dodgy cannabis and sold it onto the firm. With Tate on the warpath, furious at being made to look a fool, Nichols went round to see Steele once more. Pat wanted to meet Nichols, but Nichols wouldn't go near him. He was terrified of the man, Steele told the court. I ended up being the go-between. Pat would call me and I'd call Nichols and vice versa. Pat asked me to chaperone Nichols to Amsterdam, where I was told he was going to retrieve some money. I didn't know who he was getting the money back from, and I never saw it handed over. Nichols gave me Tate's share and then made himself scarce while I gave it to Tate, who took £2,000 out of it as my fee for going along. That was all I had to do with it. As for the gun that had been found in the loft of his house, the one that Nichols claimed he had asked him to buy shortly before the murder, the truth was that he had never seen it before in his life, he said. When the gun was originally recovered, Steele quickly made the following statement. During the search of my premises, a firearm has been recovered, because of the death of two or three persons known to me, I have now been charged with those killings. Forensic science will prevail and totally exempt the weapon found at my premises. In court, he explained that he once had a neighbour, an old man who was a bit strange and paranoid, who kept a gun in his loft that wasn't found until after he died. Having only moved into the bungalow a few months earlier, Steele was convinced that the gun had a similar origin. That court two at the Old Bailey might be witnessing an almighty miscarriage of justice seemed even more likely when on his third day in the witness box, Michael Steele finally shared his alibi for the night of the murder. At 5.01pm on the 6th of December 1995, the exact same time that Nichols claimed Steele had pulled up outside the motorcycle shop in Mark's Tay in his red Toyota Hilux, Steele had concrete proof that he was somewhere else. Graham Parkins produced a credit card receipt signed by Steele showing he was buying petrol from a Texaco garage on the A120 some 8 miles and at least 20 minutes away. Furthermore, the till receipt showed that Steele was buying 4-star petrol. The Hilux, the vehicle in which Nichols claimed he arrived at the rendezvous in, ran on diesel. As far as alibis go, it was about as strong as they come. And Steele knew it. It's shockproof, rockproof and everything else, he said. 
We then drove to Tesco's and I waited in the car while Jackie went in and bought a couple of bottles of wine. From then, we drove to the village of Bullfan near Brentwood, where we picked up the boat and trailer from the house of Dennis Wombs, Jack's uncle. We arrived at the house and knocked several times, but there was no answer, so I hitched up the trailer and drove home. Steele told the jury that he and Jackie Street arrived home at Oakland's at 7.25pm. Five minutes later, Steele's sister-in-law and her daughter arrived to view the property with a view to possibly buying it. Did you go to Rettendon on that night? asked Parkins. Nowhere near Rettendon, Steele replied confidently. We came straight home. Jackie Street did not appear at the Old Bailey. Doctors confirmed that she had been suffering from severe depression since Steele's arrest and was therefore not fit to attend court in person. After a round of legal arguments, the judge agreed that the statement she had given before becoming ill could be read out. It confirmed everything Steele had said. Further corroboration came from postwoman Phyllis Stanbrook, Steele's sister-in-law from his first marriage, who told the court that the night of the murders was the night she and her daughter Gemma went to view Steele's home. When we arrived, they were having a celebration. They had signed a contract that day for a new property, and we had champagne. She confirmed that she had arrived at the house in Great Bentley at 7.30pm, and that Steele was already there. Parkins explained that with the murders said to have taken place between 6.45 and 7pm, it would have been impossible for Steele to have been in two places that night. He could not possibly be responsible for the killings. Like Michael Steele, Jack Wombs had originally been advised against appearing in the dock. During the trial, particularly when he saw how well Steele was managing to defend himself, he changed his mind. It proved to be an emotional experience. Speaking to his defence barrister, David Lederman QC, Wombs agreed that he had been in prison at the same time as Pat Tate, and also agreed that he was an expert shot, having used his father's 12-bore shotguns from the time he was a young boy to shoot rabbits and dead branches off trees. When Lederman put to him that the prosecution would say he cold-bloodedly killed Tate along with Tucker and Rolf, Wombs could no longer hold back his feelings. I could not even kill a sparrow. Anyone who knows me knows I'm not capable of killing. To say I killed these men is ridiculous. I did not know Mr Tucker and I did not know Mr Rolf. The last time I saw Pat Tate was when he was being transferred from a prison near Haverhill, Suffolk with my brother Johnny. He was a friend. Lederman then suggested that Wombs was put up to the shooting by Steele. Wombs raised his voice again. I would not do it for anybody. I could not do it. Why would I want to do it? I deny it. I deny any suggestion I had anything to do with drugs or murder. All the stuff about the Duff drugs deal is rubbish. I would much rather put my money into motors. I would never deal in drugs. Wombs told the jury how while working as a bouncer, he had seen a girl high on drugs take her clothes off and dance naked. There was a girl like Leah Betts. She'd had some bad gear and was foaming at the mouth. That worried me sick and I called an ambulance for her. I told undercover police to come in and search for drugs. Then without warning, Wombs burst into tears and began sobbing uncontrollably in the witness box. I did not do anything like that. What they are suggesting is ridiculous. You don't know what I'm going through being locked up. They won't even let me cuddle my own son. Under cross-examination by Andrew Monday QC, Wombs admitted that he had indeed been in the Rettendon area at the time of the killings, but that it was a pure and unfortunate coincidence. He claimed that Nichols had called him and asked him to pick up a broken down Volkswagen Passat from outside a pub on the A130, just a few hundred yards from the murder scene. That, said Wombs, explained his brief mobile phone call to Nichols. He was letting him know he had got the car. Monday pointed out that his phone had also been spotted in the area the day before the killings and suggested that he was scouting the murder scene. Wombs shook his head and told Monday that with the greatest of respect, he could not be more wrong. The day before the killings, he had simply gone to see his uncle in the village of Bullfan, also close to Rettendon, to pick up Steele's boat trailer. I banged on the door. I remember the letterbox in the middle of the door. I held it open with my fingers and shouted through it, but there was no one about. Finally, I left a note. Dennis Wombs, Jack's uncle, was brought in to corroborate the story. He agreed with Jack's version of events completely. He remembered that his nephew had indeed left a note to say that he had called, but not surprisingly, he had long since thrown it away. 
Ian Bristow of the Forensic Engineers Association seemed to confirm this version of events when he told the court that Wombs could not have made the call logged on his mobile at 6.59 when Wombs was alleged to have told Nichols to come and get us because his mobile signal would not work on either of the two aerials covering the crime scene. However, if he had been on the nearby A130, he could have. Other witnesses, some of them former friends of Nichols, testified to the poor state of the Passat. It had no heater, a noisy exhaust, and to all intents, a clutch that was unusable. The idea that anyone could use this as a getaway car for a triple murder was laughable. Finally, there was only a single footprint found on the ground by the offside back door of the Range Rover, where the killer would have stood. It was identified as coming from a size 8 or 9 high-tech training shoe. Lederman pointed out that Jack Wombs wore a size 11, and according to Nichols, was wearing Wellington boots at the time of the murder. In a nutshell, there was nothing, absolutely nothing to suggest that Jack Wombs had ever been down the lane itself. If the jury looked at the facts, said Lederman, he could not possibly be responsible for the murders. You've been listening to Blogs 19, written by Tony Thompson. This book is available to purchase online at Amazon and other online book retailers. Many thanks for joining me for this video. Very shortly you'll be able to see some other videos from the channel, including the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.